preface to campaigning with grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales campaigning with grant by horace porter preface the object aimed at in this narrative is to recount the daily acts of general grant in the field to describe minutely his personal traits and habits and to explain the motives which actuated him in important crises by giving his criticisms upon events in the language employed by him at the time they took place the chief effort of the author has been to enable readers to view the union commander near by and to bring them into such intimate contact with him that they may know him as familiarly as those who served by his side it has been no part of the author's purpose to give a detailed history of the campaigns referred to but to describe the military movements only so far as necessary to show general grant's intentions and plans and the general results of his operations mention of particular commands subordinate commanders and topographical features therefore had to be in large measure omitted while serving as a personal aid to the general-in-chief the author early acquired the habit of making careful and elaborate notes of everything of interest which came under his observation and these reminiscences are simply a transcript of memoranda jotted down at the time the author end of preface chapter one of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one my first meeting with general grant a conference at thomas's headquarters grant's manner of writing dispatches opening the cracker line grant saluted by the enemy grant's personal appearance while sitting in my quarters in the little town of chattanooga tennessee about an hour after nightfall friday october twenty three eighteen sixty three an orderly brought me a message from general george h thomas commander of the army of the cumberland on whose staff i was serving summoning me to headquarters a storm had been raging for two days and a chilling rain was still falling a few minutes walk brought me to the plain wooden one-story dwelling occupied by the commander which was situated on walnut street near fourth and upon my arrival i found him in the front room on the left side of the hall with three members of his staff and several strange officers in an armchair facing the fireplace was seated a general officer slight in figure and of medium stature whose face bore an expression of weariness he was carelessly dressed and his uniform coat was unbuttoned and thrown back from his chest he held a lighted cigar in his mouth and sat in a stooping posture with his head bent slightly forward his clothes were wet and his trousers and top boots were spattered with mud general thomas approached this officer and turning to me and mentioning me by name said i want to present to you general grant thereupon the officer seated in the chair without changing his position glanced up extended his arm to its full length shook hands and said in a low voice and speaking slowly how do you do this was my first meeting with the man with whom i was destined afterward to spend so many of the most interesting years of my life the strange officers present were members of general grant's staff charles a dana assistant secretary of war who had been for some time with the army of the cumberland had also entered the room the next morning he sent a dispatch to the war department beginning with the words grant arrived last night wet dirty and well on the nineteenth of october general grant's command had been enlarged so as to cover the newly created military division of the mississippi embracing nearly the entire field of operations between the alleghanies and the mississippi river and the army of the cumberland had thus been placed under his control about a month before that army after having fought at chickamauga one of the most gallantly contested and sanguinary battles in the annals of warfare had fallen back and taken up a defensive position on the south side of the tennessee river in closing within its lines the village of chattanooga the opposing forces under general bragg had invested this position and established such a close siege 
that the lines of supply had been virtually cut off rations and forage were about exhausted and almost the last tree stump had been used for fuel most of the men were without overcoats and some without shoes ten thousand animals had died of starvation and the gloom and despondency had been increased by the approach of cold weather and the appearance of the autumn storms general grant upon assuming the responsibilities of his new command had fully realized the critical condition of the army of the cumberland and had set out at once for its headquarters to take charge in person of its future operations on his way to the front he had telegraphed general thomas from louisville to hold chattanooga at all hazards to which that intrepid soldier made the famous reply i will hold the town till we starve general grant had started the day before the incident i have described from bridgeport a place thirty miles below chattanooga where the nashville and chattanooga railroad crosses the tennessee river and had ridden by way of walden's ridge the only route left open by which communication could be had with the beleaguered town we had been advised that he was on his way but hardly expected that he would reach chattanooga that night considering the state of the weather the wretched conditions of the roads or rather bridle paths over the mountain and the severe injury to his leg which had been caused by a fall of his horse several weeks before and from which he was still suffering when he arrived he had to be lifted from his saddle and was evidently experiencing much pain as his horse had slipped in coming down the mountain and had further injured the lame leg but the general showed less signs of fatigue than might have been supposed after his hard ride of two days under such trying circumstances as soon as general grant had partaken of a light supper immediately after his arrival general thomas had sent for several general officers and most of the members of his staff to come to headquarters and the room soon contained an exceedingly interesting group a member of general thomas's staff quietly called that officer's attention to the fact that the distinguished guest's clothes were pretty wet and his boots were thoroughly soaked with rain after his long ride through the storm and intimated that colds were usually no respecters of persons general thomas's mind had been so intent upon receiving the commander and arranging for a conference of officers that he had entirely overlooked his guest's travel-stained condition but as soon as his attention was called to it all of his old-time virginia hospitality was aroused and he at once begged his newly arrived chief to step into a bedroom and change his clothes his urgings however were in vain the general thanked him politely but positively declined to make any additions to his personal comfort except to light a fresh cigar afterward however he consented to draw his chair nearer to the wood fire which was burning in the chimney-place and to thrust his feet forward to give his top boots a chance to dry the extent of his indulgence in personal comfort in the field did not seem to be much greater than that of bluff old marshal suvorov who when he wished to give himself over to an excess of luxury used to go so far as to take off one spur before going to bed at general grant's request general thomas general william f smith his chief engineer commonly known to the army as baldy smith and others pointed out on a large map the various positions of the troops and described the general situation general grant sat for some time as immovable as a rock and as silent as the sphinx but listened attentively to all that was said after a while he straightened himself up in his chair his features assumed an air of animation and in a tone of voice which manifested a deep interest in the discussion he began to fire whole volleys of questions at the officers present so intelligent were his inquiries and so pertinent his suggestions that he made a profound impression upon every one by the quickness of his perception and the knowledge which he had already acquired regarding important details of the army's condition his questions showed from the outset that his mind was dwelling not only upon the prompt opening of a line of supplies but upon taking the offensive against the enemy in this he was only manifesting one of his chief military characteristics an inborn dislike to be thrown upon the defensive 
even when he had to defend a position his method of warfare was always that of the offensive defensive after talking over a plan for communicating with our base of supplies or as he called it in his conversation opening up the cracker line an operation which already had been projected and for which preliminary steps had been taken he turned to me as chief of ordnance of the army of the cumberland and asked how much ammunition is there on hand i replied there is barely enough here to fight one day's battle but an ample supply has been accumulated at bridgeport to await the opening of communications at about half past nine o'clock he appeared to have finished his search after information for the time being and turning to a table began to write telegrams communication by wire had been kept open during all the siege his first dispatch was to general halleck the general-in-chief at washington and read have just arrived i will write to-morrow please approve order placing sherman in command of department of the tennessee with headquarters in the field he had scarcely begun to exercise the authority conferred upon him by his new promotion when his mind turned to securing advancement for sherman who had been his second in command in the army of the tennessee it was more than an hour later when he retired to bed in an adjoining room to get a much-needed rest as he arose and walked across the floor his lameness was very perceptible before the company departed he had made an appointment with general thomas and smith and several staff officers to accompany him the next day to make a personal inspection of the lines early in the morning of the twenty fourth the party set out from headquarters and most of the day was spent in examining our lines and obtaining a view of the enemy's position at brown's ferry general grant dismounted and went to the river's edge on foot and made his reconnaissance of that important part of the line in full view of the enemy's pickets on the opposite bank but singularly enough he was not fired upon being informed that the general wished to see me that evening i went into the room he was occupying at headquarters and found two of his staff officers seated near him as i entered he gave a slight nod of the head by way of recognition and pointing to a chair said rather bluntly but politely sit down in reply to a question which he asked i gave him some information he desired in regard to the character and location of certain heavy guns which i had recently assisted in putting in position on the advanced portion of our lines and the kind and amount of artillery ammunition he soon after began to write dispatches and i arose to go but resumed my seat as he said sit still my attention was soon attracted to the manner in which he went to work at his correspondence at this time as throughout his later career he wrote nearly all of his documents with his own hand and seldom dictated to any one even the most unimportant dispatch his work was performed swiftly and uninterruptedly but without any marked display of nervous energy his thoughts flowed as freely from his mind as the ink from his pen he was never at a loss for an expression and seldom interlined a word or made a material correction he sat with his head bent low over the table and when he had occasion to step to another table or desk to get a paper he wanted he would glide rapidly across the room without straightening himself and return to his seat with his body still bent over at about the same angle at which he had been sitting when he left his chair upon this occasion he tossed the sheets of paper across the table as he finished them leaving them in the wildest disorder when he had completed the dispatch he gathered up the scattered sheets read them over rapidly and arranged them in their proper order turning to me after a time he said perhaps you might like to read what i am sending i thanked him and in looking over the dispatches i found that he was ordering up sherman's entire force from corinth to within supporting distance and was informing halleck of the dispositions decided upon for the opening of a line of supplies and assuring him that everything possible would be done for the relief of burnside in east tennessee directions were also given for the taking of vigorous and comprehensive steps in every direction throughout his new and extensive command at a later hour after having given further directions in regard to the contemplated movement for the opening of the route from bridgeport to chattanooga 
and in the meantime sending back to be foraged all the animals that could be spared he bid those present a pleasant good night and limped off to his bedroom i cannot dwell too forcibly on the deep impression made upon those who had come in contact for the first time with the new commander by the exhibition they witnessed of his singular mental powers and his rare military qualities coming to us crowned with the laurels he had gained in the brilliant campaign of vicksburg we naturally expected to meet a well-equipped soldier but hardly anybody was prepared to find one who had the grasp the promptness of decision and the general administrative capacity which he displayed at the very start as commander of an extensive military division in which many complicated problems were presented for immediate solution after remaining three days as general thomas's guest general grant established his headquarters in a modest-looking two-story frame house on the bluff near the river situated on what is now known as first street in the evening of the twenty sixth i spent some time in the front room on the left side of the hall which he used as his office and in which several members of his staff were seated with him it was a memorable night in the history of the siege for the troops were being put in motion for the hazardous attempt to open the river route to our base of supplies at bridgeport the general sat at a table smoking and writing dispatches after finishing several telegrams and giving some directions to his staff he began to describe the probabilities of the chances of the expedition down the river expressing a confident belief in its success general w f smith who had been so closely identified with the project was given command of the movement at midnight he began his march down the north bank of the river with twenty eight hundred men at three o'clock on the morning of the twenty seventh hazen started silently down the stream with his pontoons carrying eighteen hundred men at five he made a landing at brown's ferry completely surprising the guard at that point and taking most of them prisoners at seven o'clock smith's force had been ferried across and began to fortify a strong position and at ten a bridge had been completed hooker's advance coming up from bridgeport arrived the next afternoon the twenty eighth at brown's ferry the river was now open from bridgeport to kelly's ferry and the wagon road from that point to chattanooga by way of brown's ferry about eight miles in length was in our possession the success of the movement had been prompt and complete and there was now established a good line of communication with our base this changed condition of affairs had been accomplished within five days after general grant's arrival at the front as soon as the enemy recovered from his surprise he woke up to the importance of the achievement longstreet was dispatched to retrieve if possible the lost ground his troops reached wahatchee in the night of the twenty eighth and made an attack upon geary's division of hooker's forces the fight raged for about three hours but geary succeeded in holding his ground against greatly superior numbers during the fight geary's teamsters had been scared and had deserted their teams and the mules stampeded by the sound of battle raging about them had broken loose from their wagons and run away fortunately for their reputation and the safety of the command they started toward the enemy and with heads down and tails up with trace chains rattling and whiffle trees snapping over the stumps of trees they rushed pell-mell upon longstreet's bewildered men believing it to be an impetuous charge of cavalry his line broke and fled the quartermaster in charge of the animals not willing to see such distinguished services go unrewarded sent in the following communication i respectfully request that the mules for their gallantry in this action may have conferred upon them the brevet rank of horses brevets in the army were being bestowed pretty freely at the time and when this recommendation was reported to general grant he laughed heartily at the humor of the suggestion our loss in the battle including killed wounded and missing was only four hundred and twenty two men the enemy never made a further attempt to interrupt our communications the much-needed supplies which had been hurried forward to bridgeport in anticipation of this movement soon reached the army and the rejoicing among the troops manifested itself in lively demonstrations of delight 
every man now felt that he was no longer to remain on the defensive but was being supplied and equipped for a forward movement against his old foe whom he had driven from the ohio to the cumberland and from the cumberland to the tennessee as soon as communication had been opened with our base of supplies general grant manifested an eagerness to acquaint himself minutely with the position of the enemy with a view to taking the offensive one morning he started toward our right with several staff officers to make a personal examination of that portion of the line when he came in sight of chattanooga creek which separated our pickets from those of the enemy he directed those who had accompanied him to halt and remain out of sight while he advanced alone which he supposed he could do without attracting much attention the pickets were within hailing distance of one another on opposite banks of the creek they had established a temporary truce on their own responsibility and the men of each army were allowed to get water from the same stream without being fired upon by those on the other side a sentinel of our picket guard recognized general grant as he approached and gave the customary cry turn out the guard commanding general the enemy on the opposite side of the creek evidently heard the words and one of his sentinels cried out turn out the guard general grant the confederate guard took up the joke and promptly formed facing our line and presented arms the general returned the salute by lifting his hat the guard was then dismissed and he continued his ride toward our left we knew that we were engaged in a civil war but such civility largely exceeded our expectations in company with general thomas and other members of his staff i was brought into almost daily contact with general grant and became intensely interested in the progress of the plans he was maturing for dealing with the enemy at all points of the theatre of war lying within his command early in november instructions came from the secretary of war calling me to washington and in accordance therewith general thomas issued an order relieving me from duty with his army footnote headquarters department of the cumberland chattanooga tennessee november five eighteen sixty three general orders number two sixty one one captain thomas g baylor ordnance corps having pursuant to orders from the secretary of war relieved captain horace porter from duty at these headquarters is announced as chief ordnance for this army and will at once enter upon the discharge of his duties the general commanding takes this occasion to express his appreciation of the valuable service rendered by captain porter during his connections with this army his thorough knowledge of the duties of his position his good judgment and untiring industry have increased the efficiency of the army and entitle him to the thanks of the general commanding by command of major-general george h thomas c goddard assistant adjutant general editor End note. I had heard through personal letters that the secretary wished to reorganize the Ordnance Bureau at Washington and wished my services in that connection on account of my long experience in that department in the field. The order was interpreted as a compliment but was distasteful to me for many reasons, although I understood that the assignment was to be only temporary and it was at a season when active operations in the field were usually suspended. It was a subject of much regret to leave General Thomas, for I had become greatly attached to him and had acquired that respect and admiration for the character of this distinguished soldier which was felt by all who had ever come in contact with him. Old Pap Thomas, as we all loved to call him, was more of a father than a commander to the younger officers who served under his immediate command, and he possessed their warmest affections he and his corps commanders now made a written appeal to general grant requesting him to intercede and endeavor to retain me in the command in the evening of the fifth of november i was sent for by general grant to come to his headquarters on my arrival he requested me to be seated at the opposite side of the table at which he sat smoking offering me a cigar and said i was sorry to see the order of the secretary of war calling you to washington i have had some other views in mind regarding your services and i still hope that i may be able to secure the recall of the order and to have you assigned to duty with me if that should be agreeable to you i replied eagerly nothing could possibly be more agreeable and i should feel most highly honored by such an assignment 
he went on to say with this step in view i have just written a letter to the general-in-chief which he then handed me to read footnote chattanooga tennessee november five eighteen sixty three major general h w halleck general-in-chief of the army captain horace porter who is now being relieved as chief ordnance officer in the department of the cumberland is represented by all officers who know him as one of the most meritorious and valuable young officers in the service so far as i have heard from general officers there is a universal desire to see him promoted to the rank of brigadier general and retained here i feel no hesitation in joining in the recommendation and ask that he may be assigned for duty with me i feel the necessity for just such an officer as captain porter is described to be at headquarters and if permitted will retain him with me if assigned here for duty i am and so forth u s grant major-general hardly allowing me to finish my expressions of surprise and gratification he continued of course you will have to obey your present orders and proceed to washington i want you to take this letter with you and see that it is put into the hands of general halleck perhaps you will soon be able to rejoin me here my requests are not always complied with at headquarters but i have written pretty strongly in this case and i hope favorable action may be taken i replied that i would make my preparations at once to start east and then withdrew the next day i called to bid the general good-bye and after taking leave of general thomas and my comrades on the staff set out for the capital by way of the new line of communication which had just been opened a description of general grant's personal appearance at this important period of his career may not be out of place here particularly as up to that time the public had received such erroneous impressions of him there were then few correct portraits of him in circulation some of the earliest pictures purporting to be photographs of him had been manufactured when he was at the distant front never stopping in one place long enough to be focused nothing daunted the practisers of that art which is the chief solace of the vein had photographed a burly beef contractor and spread the pictures broadcast as representing the determined but rather robust features of the coming hero and it was some time before the real photographs which followed were believed to be genuine false impressions of him were derived too from the fact that he had come forth from a country leather store and was famous chiefly for striking sledgehammer blows in the field and conducting relentless pursuits of his foes through the swamps of the southwest he was pictured in the popular mind as striding about in the most approved swashbuckler style of melodrama many of us were not a little surprised to find in him a man of slim figure slightly stooped five feet eight inches in height weighing only a hundred and thirty five pounds and of a modesty of mien and gentleness of manner which seemed to fit him more for the court than for the camp his eyes were dark gray and were the most expressive of his features like nearly all men who speak little he was a good listener but his face gave little indication of his thoughts and it was the expression of his eyes which furnished about the only response to the speaker who conversed with him when he was about to say anything amusing there was always a perceptible twinkle in his eyes before he began to speak and he often laughed heartily at a witty remark or a humorous incident his mouth like washington's was of the letter-box shape the contact of the lips forming a nearly horizontal line this feature was of a pattern in striking contrast with that of napoleon who had a bow mouth which looked as if it had been modelled after a front view of his cocked hat the firmness with which the general's square-shaped jaws were set when his features were in repose was highly expressive of his force of character and the strength of his will-power his hair and beard were of a chestnut-brown colour the beard was worn full no part of the face being shaved but like the hair was always kept closely and neatly trimmed like cromwell lincoln and several other great men in history he had a wart on his cheek in his case it was small and located on the right side just above the line of the beard his face was not perfectly symmetrical the left eye being a very little lower than the right 
his brow was high broad and rather square and was creased with several horizontal wrinkles which helped to emphasize the serious and somewhat careworn look which was never absent from his countenance this expression however was in no wise an indication of his nature which was always buoyant cheerful and hopeful his voice was exceedingly musical and one of the clearest in sound and most distinct in utterance that i have ever heard it had a singular power of penetration and sentences spoken by him in an ordinary tone in camp could be heard at a distance which was surprising his gait in walking might have been called decidedly unmilitary he never carried his body erect and having no ear for music or rhythm he never kept step to the airs played by the bands no matter how vigorously the bass drums emphasized the accent when walking in company there was no attempt to keep step with others in conversing he usually employed only two gestures one was the stroking of his chin beard with his left hand the other was the raising and lowering of his right hand and resting it at intervals upon his knee or a table the hand being held with the fingers close together and the knuckles bent so that the back of the hand and fingers formed a right angle when not pressed by any matter of importance he was often slow in his movements but when roused to activity he was quick in every motion and worked with marvellous rapidity he was civil to all who came in contact with him and never attempted to snub any one or treat anybody with less consideration on account of his inferiority in rank with him there was none of the puppyism so often bred by power and none of the dogmatism which samuel johnson characterized as puppyism grown to maturity End of chapter one chapter two of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two a higher grade created for grant grant's first meeting with lincoln in command of all the armies interview with stanton grant in a communicative mood at general meade's headquarters grant's narrow escape from capture grant's enormous responsibility grant's personal staff when i reached washington i went at once to headquarters and endeavored to see the commander-in-chief for the purpose of presenting general grant's letter but found after two or three attempts that it would be impossible to secure an interview i therefore gave the letter to colonel kelton his adjutant-general who placed it in general halleck's hands not only was there no action taken in regard to the request which the letter contained but its receipt was not even acknowledged this circumstance with others of its kind made it plain that general grant would never be free to make his selection of officers and organize his forces as he desired until he should be made general-in-chief elihu b washburn the member of congress from the galena district in illinois general grant's old home soon introduced a bill creating the grade of lieutenant-general and it was passed by both houses of congress with the implied understanding that general grant was to fill the position the highest grade in the army theretofore created during the war had been that of major-general the act became a law on february twenty sixth eighteen sixty four and the nomination of general grant was sent to the senate by mr lincoln on the first of march and confirmed on the second on the third the general was ordered to washington i had set to work upon my duties in the ordnance bureau and in the meantime had received several very kind messages from the general regarding the chances of my returning to the field on the evening of march eighth the president and mrs lincoln gave a public reception at the white house which i attended the president stood in the usual reception room known as the blue room with several cabinet officers near him and shook hands cordially with everybody as the vast procession of men and women passed in front of him he was in evening dress and wore a turned-down collar a size too large the necktie was rather broad and awkwardly tied he was more of a hercules than an adonis his height of six feet four inches enabled him to look over the heads of most of his visitors his form was ungainly and the movements of his long angular arms and legs bordered at times upon the grotesque his eyes were gray and disproportionately small 
his face wore a general expression of sadness the deep lines indicating the sense of responsibility which weighed upon him but at times his features lighted up with a broad smile and there was a merry twinkle in his eyes as he greeted an old acquaintance and exchanged a few words with him in a tone of familiarity he had sprung from the common people to become one of the most uncommon of men mrs lincoln occupied a position on his right for a time she stood on a line with him and took part in the reception but afterward stepped back and conversed with some of the wives of the cabinet officers and other personal acquaintances who were in the room at about half-past nine o'clock a sudden commotion near the entrance to the room attracted general attention and upon looking in that direction i was surprised to see general grant walking along modestly with the rest of the crowd toward mr lincoln he had arrived from the west that evening and had come to the white house to pay his respects to the president he had been in washington but once before when he visited it for a day soon after he had left west point although these two historical characters had never met before mr lincoln recognized the general at once from the pictures he had seen of him with a face radiant with delight he advanced rapidly two or three steps toward his distinguished visitor and cried out why here is general grant well this is a great pleasure i assure you at the same time seizing him by the hand and shaking it for several minutes with a vigor which showed the extreme cordiality of the welcome the scene now presented was deeply impressive standing face to face for the first time were the two illustrious men whose names will always be inseparably associated in connection with the war of the rebellion grant's right hand grasped the lapel of his coat his head was bent slightly forward and his eyes upturned toward lincoln's face the president who was eight inches taller looked down with beaming countenance upon his guest although their appearance their training and their characteristics were in striking contrast yet the two men had many traits in common and there were numerous points of resemblance in their remarkable careers each was of humble origin and had been compelled to learn the first lessons of life in the severe school of adversity each had risen from the people possessed an abiding confidence in them and always retained a deep hold upon their affections each might have said to those who were inclined to sneer at his plain origin what a marshal of france who had risen from the ranks to a dukedom said to the hereditary nobles who attempted to snub him in vienna i am an ancestor you are only descendants in a great crisis of their country's history both had entered the public service from the same state both were conspicuous for the possession of that uncommon of all virtues common sense both despised the arts of the demagogue and shrank from posing for effect or indulging in mock heroics even when their characteristics differed they only served to supplement each other and to add a still greater strength to the cause for which they strove with hearts too great for rivalry with souls untouched by jealousy they lived to teach the world that it is time to abandon the path of ambition when it becomes so narrow that two cannot walk it abreast the statesman and the soldier conversed for a few minutes and then the president presented his distinguished guest to mr seward the secretary of state was very demonstrative in his welcome and after exchanging a few words led the general to where mrs lincoln was standing and presented him to her mrs lincoln expressed much surprise and pleasure at the meeting and she and the general chatted together very pleasantly for some minutes the visitors had by this time become so curious to catch a sight of the general that their eagerness knew no bounds and they became altogether unmanageable mr seward's consummate knowledge of the wiles of diplomacy now came to the rescue and saved the situation he succeeded in struggling through the crowd with the general until they reached the large east room where the people could circulate more freely this however was only a temporary relief the people by this time had worked themselves up to a state of uncontrollable excitement the vast throng surged and swayed and crowded until alarm was felt for the safety of the ladies cries now arose of grant 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 then came cheer after cheer seward after some persuasion induced the general to stand upon a sofa thinking the visitors would be satisfied with a view of him and retire 
but as soon as they caught sight of him their shouts were renewed and a rush was made to shake his hand the president sent word that he and the secretary of war would await the general's return in one of the small drawing-rooms but it was fully an hour before he was able to make his way there and then only with the aid of several officers and ushers the story has been circulated that at the conference which then took place or at the interview the next day the president and the secretary of war urged general grant to make his campaign toward richmond by the overland route and finally persuaded him to do so although he had set forth the superior advantages of the water route there is not the slightest foundation for this rumor general grant some time after repeated to the members of his staff just what had taken place and no reference whatever was made to the choice of these two routes the next day march nine the general went to the white house by invitation of mr lincoln for the purpose of receiving his commission from the hands of the president upon his return to willard's hotel i called to pay my respects curiosity led me to look at the hotel register and the modesty of the entry upon the book in the general's handwriting made an impression upon me it read simply u s grant and son galena illinois his eldest boy fred accompanied him the act which created the grade of lieutenant general authorized a personal staff to consist of a chief of staff with the rank of brigadier general four aides-de-camp and two military secretaries each with the rank of lieutenant colonel in our conversation the general referred to this circumstance and offered me one of the positions of aide-de-camp which i said i would accept very gladly the next day the tenth he paid a visit by rail to the headquarters of the army of the potomac near brandy station in virginia about seventy miles from washington he returned the day after and started the same night for nashville to meet sherman and turn over to him the command of the military division of the mississippi while in washington general grant had been so much an object of curiosity had been so continually surrounded by admiring crowds when he appeared in the streets and even in his hotel that it had become very irksome to him with his simplicity and total lack of personal vanity he did not seem able to understand why he should attract so much attention the president had given him a cordial invitation to dine that evening at the white house but he begged to be excused for the reason that he would lose a whole day which he could not afford at that critical period besides he added i have become very tired of this show business on the twelfth the official order was issued placing general grant in command of all the armies of the united states i soon learned that the secretary of war in spite of general grant's request to have me assigned to his staff wanted to insist upon my continuing my duties in the department at washington and i resolved to have an interview with him and to protest against such action the secretary had a wide reputation for extreme brusqueness in his intercourse even with his friends and seemed determined as an officer once expressed it to administer discipline totally regardless of previous acquaintance a frenchman once said that during the revolution while the guillotine was at work he never heard the name of robespierre that he did not take off his hat to see whether his head was still on his shoulders some of our officers were similarly inclined when they heard the name of stanton however i found the secretary quite civil and even patient and to all appearances disposed to allow my head to continue to occupy the place where i was in the habit of wearing it nevertheless the interview ended without his having yielded i certainly received a very cold bath at his hands and to this day i never see the impress of his unrelenting features upon a one dollar treasury note without feeling a chill run down my back general grant returned to the capital on march twenty third i went to willard's to call upon him that evening and encountered him on the stairs leading up to the first floor he stopped and shook hands and greeted me with the words how do you do colonel i replied i had hoped to be colonel by this time owing to your interposition but what i feared has been realized much against my wishes the secretary of war seems to have made up his mind to keep me here i will see him to-morrow and urge the matter in person answered the general he then invited me to accompany him to his room and in the course of a conversation which followed said that he had had sheridan ordered east to take command of the cavalry of the army of the potomac 
sheridan arrived in washington on april fourth he had been worn down almost to a shadow by hard work and exposure in the field he weighed only a hundred and fifteen pounds and as his height was but five feet six inches he looked anything but formidable as a candidate for a cavalry leader he had met the president and the officials at the war department that day for the first time and it was his appearance on this occasion which gave rise to a remark made to general grant the next time he visited the department the officer you brought on from the west is rather a little fellow to handle your cavalry to which grant replied you will find him big enough for the purpose before we get through with him general grant had started for the field on the twenty sixth of march and established his headquarters in the little town of culpeper court house in virginia twelve miles north of the rapidan he visited washington about once a week to confer with the president and the secretary of war i continued my duties in the department at washington till my fate should be decided and on the twenty seventh of april i found that the request of the general-in-chief had prevailed and my appointment was officially announced as an aide-de-camp on his personal staff the afternoon of april twenty nine i arrived at culpeper and reported to him for duty a plain brick house near the railway station had been taken for headquarters and a number of tents had been pitched in the yard to furnish additional accommodations the next morning the general called for his horse to ride over to general meade's headquarters near brandy station about six miles distant he selected me as the officer who was to accompany him and we set out together on the trip followed by two orderlies he was mounted upon his large bay horse cincinnati which afterward became so well known throughout the army the animal was not called after the family of the ancient warrior who beat his sword into a ploughshare but after our modern city of that name he was a half-brother to asteroid and kentucky the famous racers and was consequently of excellent blood noticing the agility with which the general flung himself into the saddle i remarked i'm very glad to see that your injured leg no longer disables you no he replied it gives me scarcely any trouble now although sometimes it feels a little numb as we rode along he began to speak of his new command and said i have watched the progress of the army of the potomac ever since it was organized and have been greatly interested in reading the accounts of the splendid fighting it has done i always thought the territory covered by its operations would be the principal battleground of the war when i was in cairo in 1861 the height of my ambition was to command a brigade of cavalry in this army i suppose it was my fondness for horses that made me feel that i should be more at home in command of cavalry and i thought that the army of the potomac would present the best field of operations for a brigade commander in that arm of the service he then changed the subject to chattanooga and in speaking of that battle interjected into his descriptions brief criticisms upon the services and characteristics of several of the officers who had taken part in the engagement he continued by saying the difficulty is in finding commanding officers possessed of sufficient breadth of view and administrative ability to confine their attention to perfecting their organizations and giving a general supervision to their commands instead of wasting their time upon details for instance there is a general g he is a very gallant officer but at a critical period of the battle of chattanooga he neglected to give the necessary directions to his troops and concentrated all his efforts upon aiming and firing some heavy guns a service which could have been better performed by any lieutenant of artillery i had to order him peremptorily to leave the battery and give his attention to his troops he then spoke of his experiences with mr lincoln and the very favorable impression the president had made upon him he said in the first interview i had with the president when no others were present and he could talk freely he told me that he did not pretend to know anything about the handling of troops and it was with the greatest reluctance that he ever interfered with the movements of army commanders but he had common sense enough to know that celerity was absolutely necessary that while armies were sitting down waiting for opportunities to churn up which might perhaps be more favorable from a strictly military point of view the government was spending millions of dollars every day that there was a limit to the sinews of war 
and a time might be reached when the spirits and resources of the people would become exhausted he had always contended that these considerations should be taken into account as well as purely military questions and that he adopted the plan of issuing his executive orders principally for the purpose of hurrying the movements of commanding generals but that he believed i knew the value of minutes and that he was not going to interfere with my operations he said further that he did not want to know my plans that it was perhaps better that he should not know them for everybody he met was trying to find out from him something about the contemplated movements and there was always a temptation to leak i have not communicated my plans to him or to the secretary of war the only suggestion the president made and it was merely a suggestion not a definite plan was entirely impractical and it was not again referred to in our conversation he told me in our first private interview a most amusing anecdote regarding a delegation of crossroads wiseacres as he called them who came to see him one day to criticize my conduct in paroling pemberton's army after the surrender at vicksburg who insisted that the men would violate their paroles and in less than a month confront me anew in the field and have to be whipped all over again said mr lincoln i thought the best way to get rid of them was to tell them the story of sykes dog have you ever heard about sykes yellow dog said i to the spokesman of the delegation he said he hadn't well i must tell you about him said i sykes had a yellow dog he set great store by but there were a lot of small boys around the village and that's always a bad thing for dogs you know these boys didn't share sykes's views and they were not disposed to let the dog have a fair show even sykes had to admit that the dog was getting unpopular in fact it was soon seen that a prejudice was growing up against that dog that threatened to wreck all his future prospects in life the boys after meditating how they could get the best of him finally fixed up a cartridge with a long fuse put the cartridge in a piece of meat dropped the meat in the road in front of sykes's door and then perched themselves on a fence a good distance off holding the end of the fuse in their hands then they whistled for the dog when he came out he scented the bait and bolted the meat cartridge and all the boys touched off the fuse with a cigar and in about a second a report came from that dog that sounded like a clap of thunder sykes came bouncing out of the house and yelled what's up anything busted there was no reply except a snicker from the small boys roosting on the fence but as sykes looked up he saw the whole air filled with pieces of yellow dog he picked up the biggest piece he could find a portion of the back with a part of the tail still hanging to it and after turning it round and looking it all over he said well i guess he'll never be much account again as a dog and i guess pemberton's forces will never be much account again as an army the delegation began looking around for their hats before i had quite got to the end of the story and i was never bothered any more after that about superseding the commander of the army of the tennessee the general related this anecdote with more animation than he usually displayed and with the manifestation of a keen sense of the humorous and remarked afterward but no one who does not possess the president's unequalled powers of mimicry can pretend to convey an idea of the amusing manner in which he told the story this characteristic illustration employed by the president was used afterwards in a garbled form by writers in an attempt to apply it to other events i give the original version when we reached general meade's camp that officer who was sitting in his quarters came out and greeted the general-in-chief warmly shaking hands with him before he dismounted general meade was then forty-nine years of age of rather a spare figure and graceful in his movements he had a full beard which like his hair was brown slightly tinged with gray he wore a slouched felt hat with a conical crown and a turned-down brim which gave him a sort of tyrolese appearance the two commanders entered meade's quarters sat down lighted their cigars and held a long interview regarding the approaching campaign i now learned that two days before the time had been definitely named at which the opening campaign was to begin and that on the next wednesday may four the armies were to move meade in speaking of his troops always referred to him as my people 
during this visit i had an opportunity to meet a number of old acquaintances whom i had not seen since i served with the army of the potomac on general mcclellan's staff two years before after the interview had ended i returned with the general to headquarters riding at a brisk trot his conversation now turned upon the commander of the army of the potomac in the course of which he remarked i had never met general meade since the mexican war until i visited his headquarters when i came east last month in my first interview with him he talked in a manner which led me to form a very high opinion of him he referred to the changes which were taking place and said it had occurred to him that i might want to make a change in the commander of the army of the potomac and to put in his place sherman or some other officer who had served with me in the west and urged me not to hesitate on his account if i desired to make such an assignment he added that the success of the cause was much more important than any consideration for the feelings of an individual he spoke so patriotically and unselfishly that even if i had any intention of relieving him i should have been inclined to change my mind after the manly attitude he assumed in this frank interview this was the first long personal talk i had with the general-in-chief as our intercourse heretofore had been only of an official character and the exhibition of the remarkable power he possessed as a conversationalist was a revelation i began to learn that his reputed reticence did not extend to his private intercourse and that he had the ability to impart a peculiar charm to almost any topic that evening a large correspondence was conducted in relation to the final preparations for the coming movements a few days before an occurrence had happened which came very near depriving the armies of the services of general grant in the virginia campaign on his return to headquarters after his last visit to the president in washington when his special train reached warrenton junction he saw a large cloud of dust to the east of the road upon making inquiries of the station-master as to its cause he learned that colonel mosby who commanded a partisan confederate force called by his own people mosby's conglomerates and who had become famous for his cavalry raids had just passed driving a detachment of our cavalry before him if the train had been a few minutes earlier mosby like christopher columbus upon his voyage to this country would have discovered something which he was not looking for as the train carried no guard it would not have been possible to make any defence in such case the union commander would have reached richmond a year sooner than he finally arrived there but not at the head of an army general grant now held a command the magnitude of which has seldom been equalled in history his troops consisted of twenty-one army corps and the territory covered by the field of operations embraced eighteen military departments besides the region held by the army of the potomac which had never been organized into a department the total number of troops under his command present for duty equipped was five hundred and thirty three thousand in all purely military questions his will was at this time almost supreme and his authority was usually unquestioned he occupied the most conspicuous position in the nation not excepting that of the president himself and the eyes of all the loyal people in the land were turned to him appealingly as the one man upon whom their hopes were centred and in whom their chief faith reposed the responsibilities imposed were commensurate with the magnitude of the undertaking which had been confided to him while commanding all the armies of the nation he had wisely decided to establish his headquarters with the army of the potomac and give his immediate supervision to the operations of that force and the troops which were intended to cooperate with it in the state of virginia telegraphic communication was then open with nearly all the armies the staff consisted of fourteen officers only and was not larger than that of some division commanders the chief of staff was brigadier general john a rawlins when the war broke out he was a practicing lawyer in galena illinois and had gained some prominence in politics as a democrat after the firing upon fort sumter a public meeting was held in galena and captain grant being an ex-army officer was called upon to preside rawlins attended the meeting and made a stirring and effective speech declaring it to be the duty of all good citizens to sink their political predilections and urging them to pledge themselves to the support of the union and the enforcement of the laws 
general grant was much impressed with the vigor and logic of the address and when he was afterwards assigned to the command of a brigade he appointed rawlins on his staff he was at first aide-de-camp afterward assistant adjutant-general and finally chief of staff the general had a high regard for him officially and was warmly attached to him personally rawlins in his youth had worked on a farm and assisted his father in burning charcoal obtaining what education he could acquire at odd times in the district school and at a neighboring seminary he was frank honest and resolute and loyally devoted to his chief he always had the courage of his convictions and was capable of stating them with great force he was plain and simple in manner of a genial disposition and popular with all the other members of the staff he had never served in a military organization nor made a study of the art of war but he possessed natural executive ability of a high order and developed qualities which made him exceedingly useful to his chief and to the service the rest of the staff consisted of the following officers lieutenant colonel c b comstock aide-de-camp an officer of the united states corps of engineers with a well-deserved reputation for scientific attainments who had shown great efficiency while serving with general grant in the vicksburg campaign lieutenant colonel o e babcock aide-de-camp an accomplished officer of engineers who had gained an excellent reputation in several campaigns in which he had been conspicuous for his good judgment and great personal courage lieutenant colonel f t dent aide-de-camp a classmate of general grant and brother of mrs grant he had served with credit in the mexican war and in scott's advance upon the city of mexico had been severely wounded and was twice promoted for gallant and meritorious conduct in battle the four officers just named were of the regular army and were graduates of the west point military academy lieutenant colonel adam badeau military secretary who had first gone to the field as a newspaper correspondent and was afterward made an aide-de-camp to general t w sherman he was badly wounded in the foot at fort hudson and when convalescent was assigned to the staff of general grant he had had a good training in literature and was an accomplished writer and scholar lieutenant colonel william r raleigh military secretary was also from galena he entered an illinois regiment as a lieutenant and after the battle of donelson was made a captain and aide-de-camp to general grant his gallant conduct at shiloh where he greatly distinguished himself commended him still more highly to his commander he resigned august thirty eighteen sixty four and was succeeded by captain parker lieutenant colonel t s bowers assistant adjutant-general was a young editor of a country newspaper in illinois when hostilities began he raised a company of volunteers for the forty eighth illinois infantry but declined the captaincy and fought in the ranks he was detailed as a clerical assistant at general grant's headquarters in the donelson campaign and was soon made a lieutenant and afterward a captain and aide-de-camp his services in all the subsequent campaigns were highly appreciated by his chief lieutenant colonel w l duff had been for a time acting chief of artillery under general grant in the west and was now assigned to duty as assistant inspector general captain eli s parker assistant adjutant general who was a full-blooded indian a grand nephew of the famous red jacket and reigning chief of the tribes known as the six nations his indian name was donahogawa colonel parker had received a good education and was a civil engineer employed upon the united states government building in galena at the breaking out of the war he commended himself to general grant by his conduct in the vicksburg campaign and was there placed on his staff and served in the adjutant general's department captain george k leet assistant adjutant general who had come east with general grant from the army of the tennessee and who was assigned to duty at the headquarters of the army in washington and remained there during the campaign captain h w janes assistant quartermaster captain peter t hudson a volunteer officer from the state of iowa had served with the general in the west and was retained as an aide-de-camp 
lieutenant william mckee dunn jr a beardless boy of nineteen was assigned as an acting aide-de-camp to general rawlins but performed general staff duty at headquarters and under many trying circumstances proved himself as cool and gallant as the most experienced veteran all the members of the staff had had abundant experience in the field and were young active and ready for any kind of hard work End of chapter 2three of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three preparations for a general advance grant's reasons for moving by the left flank his instructions to his staff grant's numerical strength offset by lee's strategical advantage crossing the rapidan the headquarters mess on the eve of battle longstreet's estimate of grant an early breakfast at headquarters grant and meade pitch tents in the wilderness grant hears of the death of an old comrade a conference between grant and meade the night of may third will always be memorable in the recollection of those who assembled in the little front room of the house occupied as headquarters at culpeper the eight senior members of the staff seated themselves that evening about their chief to receive their final instructions and participated in an intensely interesting discussion of the grand campaign which was to begin the next morning with all its hopes its uncertainties and its horrors sherman had been instructed to strike joseph e johnston's army in northwest georgia and make his way to atlanta banks was to advance up the red river and capture shreveport siegel was ordered to make an expedition down the valley of virginia and endeavor to destroy a portion of the east tennessee virginia and georgia railroad his movement was expected to keep lee from withdrawing troops from the valley and reinforcing his principal army known as the army of northern virginia butler was directed to move up the james river and endeavor to secure petersburg and the railways leading into it and if opportunity offered to seize richmond itself burnside with the ninth corps which had been moving from annapolis into virginia was to support the army of the potomac the subsequent movements of all the forces operating in virginia were to depend largely upon the result of the first battles between the army of the potomac and the army of northern virginia general grant felt as he afterward expressed it in his official report that our armies had acted heretofore too independently of one another without concert like a bulky team no two ever pulling together to obviate this he had made up his mind to launch all his armies against the confederacy at the same time to give the enemy no rest and to allow him no opportunity to reinforce any of his armies by troops which were not themselves confronted by union forces the general sat for some time preparing a few final instructions in writing after he had finished he turned his back to the table crossed one leg over the other lighted a fresh cigar and began to talk of the momentous movement which in a few hours was to begin he said i weighed very carefully the advantages and disadvantages of moving against lee's left and moving against his right the former promises more decisive results if immediately successful and would best prevent lee from moving north to make raids but it would deprive our army of the advantages of easy communication with a water base of supplies and compel us to carry such a large amount of ammunition and rations in wagon trains and detach so many troops as train guards that i found it presented too many serious difficulties and when i considered especially the sufferings of the wounded in being transported long distances overland instead of being carried by short routes to water where they would be comfortably moved by boats i had no longer any hesitation in deciding to cross the rapidan below the position occupied by lee's army and move by our left this plan will also enable us to cooperate better with butler's forces and not become separated too far from them i shall not give my attention so much to richmond as to lee's army and i want all commanders to feel that hostile armies and not cities are to be their objective points it was the understanding that lee's army was to be the objective point of the army of the potomac and it was to move against richmond only in case lee went there to use grant's own language to meade 
wherever lee goes there you will go also he of course thought it likely that lee would fall back upon richmond in case of defeat and place himself behind its fortifications for he had said to meade in his instructions to him should a siege of richmond become necessary ammunition and equipment can be got from the arsenals at washington and fort monroe and during the discussion that evening he rose from his seat stepped up to a map hanging upon the wall and with a sweep of his forefinger indicated a line around richmond and petersburg and remarked when my troops are there richmond is mine lee must retreat or surrender he then communicated verbal instructions to his staff which gave the key to his method of handling troops in actual battle and showed the value he placed upon the celerity and the overcoming of delays in communicating orders he said to us i want you to discuss with me freely from time to time the details of the orders given for the conduct of a battle and learn my views as fully as possible as to what course should be pursued in all the contingencies which may arise i expect to send you to the critical points of the lines to keep me promptly advised of what is taking place and in cases of great emergency when new dispositions have to be made on the instant or it becomes suddenly necessary to reinforce one command by sending to its aid troops from another and there is not time to communicate with headquarters i want you to explain my views to commanders and urge immediate action looking to cooperation without waiting for specific orders from me he said he would locate his headquarters near those of meade and communicate his instructions through that officer and through burnside whose command at this time was independent of the army of the potomac but that emergencies might arise in which he himself would have to give immediate direction to troops when actually engaged in battle he never made known his plans far in advance to any one it was his invariable custom to keep his contemplated movements locked up in his own mind to avoid all possibility of their being mentioned what impressed every one most was the self-reliance placed in perfecting his plans and his absolute faith in their success his calm confidence communicated itself to all who listened to him and inspired them with a feeling akin to that of their chief the discussion did not end till long past midnight as usual on the eve of a battle before the general retired he wrote a letter to mrs grant i did not know the nature of the contents of the letters to his wife until after the war when mrs grant in speaking of them said that they always contained words of cheer and comfort expressed an abiding faith in victory and never failed to dwell upon the sad thought which always oppressed him when he realized that many human lives would have to be sacrificed and great suffering would have to be endured by the wounded the general's letters to his wife were very frequent during a campaign and no pressure of official duties was ever permitted to interrupt this correspondence the rapidan separated the two hostile forces in northern virginia lee's headquarters were at orange court house a distance of seventeen miles from culpeper the army of the potomac consisted of the second corps commanded by hancock the fifth commanded by warren the sixth commanded by sedgwick and the cavalry corps under sheridan besides these there was burnside's separate command consisting of the ninth army corps these troops numbered in all about a hundred and sixteen thousand present for duty equipped the army of northern virginia consisted of three infantry corps commanded respectively by longstreet ewell and a p hill and a cavalry corps commanded by j e b stuart its exact strength has never been accurately ascertained but from the best data available it has been estimated at about seventy thousand present for duty equipped general grant in his memoirs puts the number as high as eighty thousand those familiar with military operations and unprejudiced in their opinion will concede that notwithstanding lee's inferiority in numbers the advantages were nevertheless in his favor in the approaching campaign having interior lines he was able to move by shorter marches and to act constantly on the defensive at a period of the war when troops had learned to entrench themselves with marvellous rapidity and force the invading army continually to assault fortified positions 
the task to be performed by the union forces was that of conducting a moving siege the field of operations with its numerous rivers and creeks difficult of approach its lack of practicable roads its dense forests its impassable swamps and its trying summer climate debilitating to northern troops seemed especially designed by nature for purposes of defence lee and his officers were familiar with every foot of the ground and every inhabitant was eager to give them information his army was in a friendly country from which provisions could be drawn from all directions and few troops had to be detached to guard lines of supply the union army on the contrary was unfamiliar with the country was without accurate maps could seldom secure trustworthy guides and had to detach large bodies of troops from the main command to guard its long lines of communication protect its supply trains and conduct the wounded to points of safety the southern confederacy was virtually a military despotism with a soldier at the head of its government and officers were appointed in the army entirely with reference to their military qualifications since lee had taken command he had not lost a single battle fought in the state of virginia and the prestige of success had an effect upon his troops the importance of which cannot easily be overestimated his men were made to feel that they were fighting for their homes and firesides the pulpit the press and women were making superhuman efforts to fire the southern heart disasters were concealed temporary advantages were magnified into triumphant victories and crushing defeats were hailed as blessings in disguise in the north there was a divided press with much carping criticism on the part of journals opposed to the war which was fitted to discourage the troops and destroy their confidence in their leaders there were hosts of southern sympathizers constituting a foe in the rear whose threats and overt acts often necessitated the withdrawal of troops from the front to hold them in check in all the circumstances no just military critic will claim that the advantage was on the side of the union army merely because it was numerically larger the campaign in virginia was to begin by throwing the army of the potomac with all celerity to the south side of the rapidan below lee's position the infantry moved a little after twelve o'clock in the morning of may four the cavalry dashed forward in advance under cover of the night drove in the enemy's pickets secured germana ford and also ely's ford six miles below and before six o'clock in the morning had laid two pontoon bridges at each place and passed to the south side of the river warren's corps crossed at germana ford followed by sedgwick's while hancock's corps made the passage at ely's ford at eight a m the general-in-chief with his staff started from headquarters and set out for germana ford following warren's troops he was mounted upon his bay horse cincinnati equipped with a saddle of the grimsley pattern which was somewhat the worse for wear as the general had used it in all his campaigns from donelson to the present time rawlins was on his left and rode a clay bank horse he had brought from the west named general blair in honor of frank p blair who commanded a corps in the army of the tennessee general grant was dressed in a uniform coat and waistcoat the coat being unbuttoned on his hands were a pair of yellowish brown thread gloves he wore a pair of plain top boots reaching to his knees and was equipped with a regulation sword spurs and sash on his head was a slouch hat of black felt with a plain gold cord around it his orderly carried strapped behind his saddle the general's overcoat which was that of a private soldier of cavalry a sun as bright as the sun of austerlitz shone down upon the scene its light brought out in vivid colors the beauties of the landscape which lay before us and its rays were reflected with dazzling brilliancy from the brass field pieces and the white coverings of the wagons as they rolled lazily along in the distance the crisp bracing air seemed to impart to all a sense of exhilaration as far as the eye could reach the troops were wending their way to the front their war banners bullet riddled and battle stained floated proudly in the morning breeze the roads resounded to the measured tread of the advancing columns and the deep forests were lighted by the glitter of their steel 
the quick elastic step and easy swinging gait of the men the cheery look upon their faces and the lusty shouts with which they greeted their new commander as he passed gave proof of the temper of their mettle and the superb spirit which animated their hearts if the general's nature had been as emotional as that of napoleon he might have been moved to utter the words of the french emperor as his troops filed past him in moving to the field of waterloo magnificent magnificent but as general grant was neither demonstrative nor communicative he gave no expression whatever to his feelings with the party on the way to the front rode a citizen whose identity and purposes soon became an object of anxious inquiry among the troops his plain black funereal-looking citizen's clothes presented a sight not often witnessed on a general's staff and attracted no little attention on the part of the soldiers who began to make audible side remarks evincing a searching curiosity to know whether the general had brought his private undertaker with him or whether it was a parson who had joined headquarters so as to be on hand to read the funeral service over the southern confederacy when the boys succeeded in getting it into the last ditch the person was mr e b washburn member of congress from general grant's district who had arrived at headquarters a few days before and had expressed a desire to accompany the army upon the opening campaign to which the general had readily assented a short time before noon the general-in-chief crossed one of the pontoon bridges at germana ford to the south side of the rapidan rode to the top of the bluff overlooking the river and there dismounted and established temporary headquarters at an old farmhouse with dutch gables and porch in front it was rather dilapidated in appearance and looked as if it had been deserted for some time the only furniture it contained was a table and two chairs meade's headquarters were located close by general grant sat down on the steps of the house lighted a cigar and remained silent for some time quietly watching sedgwick's men passing over the bridge after a while he said well the movement so far has been as satisfactory as could be desired we have succeeded in seizing the fords and crossing the river without loss or delay lee must by this time know upon what roads we are advancing but he may not yet realize the full extent of the movement we shall probably soon get some indications as to what he intends to do a representative of a newspaper with whom the general was acquainted now stepped up to him and said general grant about how long will it take you to get to richmond the general replied at once i will agree to be there in about four days that is if general lee becomes a party to the agreement but if he objects the trip will undoubtedly be prolonged the correspondent looked as if he did not see just how he could base any definite predictions upon this oracular response i happened to be looking over a field map at the time and at the general's request handed it to him he examined it attentively for a few minutes and then returned it without making any remarks the main roads were pretty well represented on our maps the gamana road runs a little east of south five miles from the rapidan it is crossed by a road running east and west called the orange turnpike a mile beyond it intersects the brock road which runs north and south and a mile farther on the brock road is crossed by the orange plank road running east and west there were also some narrow crossroads cut through the woods in various places about one o'clock word came from meade that our signal officers had succeeded in deciphering a message sent to general ewell which read as follows we are moving had i not better move d and d toward new verdierville signed r the general manifested considerable satisfaction at receiving this news and remarked that gives just the information i wanted it shows that lee is drawing out from his position and is pushing across to meet us he now called for writing material and placing a book upon his knee laid the paper upon it wrote a dispatch to burnside at rappahannock station saying make forced marches until you reach this place start your troops now in the rear the moment they can be got off and require them to make a night march a cold lunch was then eaten off a pine table in the dining-room of the deserted house later in the afternoon our tents arrived and were pitched near the house and a little before dark the mess sat down to dinner
the table had been laid under the fly of a large tent of the pattern known as the hospital tent perhaps no headquarters of a general in supreme command of great armies ever presented so democratic an appearance all the officers of the staff dined at the table with their chief and the style of conversation was as familiar as that which occurs in the household of any private family nothing could have been more informal or unconventional than the manner in which the mess was conducted the staff officers came to the table and left it at such times as their duties permitted sometimes lingering over a meal to indulge in conversation at other times remaining to take only a few mouthfuls in all haste before starting out upon the lines the chief ate less and talked less than any other member of the staff and partook only of the plainest food a campfire of dry fence rails had been built in front of the general's tent not because the evening was particularly cold but for the reason that the fire lighted up the scene and made the camp look more cheerful general meade came over to headquarters after dinner and took a seat upon a folding camp chair by our fire and he and general grant entered into a most interesting discussion of the situation and the plans for the next day the general-in-chief offered meade a cigar the wind was blowing and he had some difficulty in lighting it when general grant offered him his flint and steel which overcame the difficulty the general always carried in the field a small silver tinder-box in which there was a flint and steel with which to strike a spark and a coil of fuse which was easily ignited by the spark and not affected by the wind the french would call it a briquet while the two generals were talking and a number of staff officers sitting by listening telegrams were received from washington saying that sherman had advanced in georgia butler had ascended the james river and siegel's force were moving down the valley of virginia these advances were in obedience to general grant's previous orders he said i don't expect much from siegel's movement it is made principally for the purpose of preventing the enemy in his front from withdrawing troops to reinforce lee's army to use an expression of mr lincoln's employed in my last conversation with him when i was speaking of this general policy if siegel can't skin himself he can hold a leg while somebody else skins it is very gratifying to know that hancock and warren have made a march to-day of over twenty miles with scarcely any stragglers from their commands telegrams were now sent to washington announcing the entire success of the crossing of the rapidan and saying that it would be demonstrated before long whether the enemy intended to give battle on that side of richmond meade soon after retired to his headquarters and a little while before midnight general grant entered his tent and turned in for the night its only furniture consisted of a portable cot made of a coarse canvas stretcher over a light wooden frame a tin wash basin which stood on an iron tripod two folding camp chairs and a plain pine table the general's baggage was limited to one small camp trunk which contained his underclothing toilet articles a suit of clothes and an extra pair of boots general longstreet then commanding a corps in lee's army told me several years after the war that the evening on which news was received that grant intended to give personal direction to the army which was to operate against lee he had a conversation on the subject at lee's headquarters an officer present talked very confidently of being able to whip with all ease the western general who was to confront them at which longstreet said do you know grant no the officer replied well i do replied longstreet i was in the corps of cadets with him at west point for three years i was present at his wedding i served in the same army with him in mexico i have observed his methods of warfare in the west and i believe i know him through and through and i tell you that we cannot afford to underrate him and the army he now commands we must make up our minds to get into line of battle and to stay there for that man will fight us every day and every hour till the end of this war in order to whip him we must outmanoeuvre him and husband our strength as best we can
after the officers at headquarters had obtained what sleep they could get they arose about daylight feeling that in all probability they would witness before night either a fight or a foot race a fight if the armies encountered each other a foot race to secure good positions if the armies remained apart general meade had started south at dawn moving along the gamana road general grant intended to remain in his present camp till burnside arrived in order to give him some directions in person regarding his movements the general sat down to the breakfast table after nearly all the staff officers had finished their morning meal while he was slowly sipping his coffee a young newspaper reporter whose appetite combined with his spirit of enterprise had gained a substantial victory over his modesty slipped up to the table took a seat at the farther end and remarked well i wouldn't mind taking a cup of something warm myself if there's no objection thereupon seizing a coffee-pot he poured out a full ration of that soothing army beverage and after helping himself to some of the other dishes proceeded to eat breakfast with an appetite which had evidently been stimulated by long hours of fasting the general paid no more attention to this occurrence than he would have paid to the flight of a bird across his path he scarcely looked at the intruder did not utter a word at the time and made no mention of it afterward it was a fair sample of the imperturbability of his nature as to trivial matters taking place about him general grant sent a message to meade at eight twenty four a m saying among other things if an opportunity presents itself for pitching into a part of lee's army do so without giving time for dispositions it will be observed from this dispatch and many others which follow that nearly all of our commanding officers in the field indulged in a certain amount of colloquialism in their communications perhaps it seemed to them to make the style less stilted to give more snap to their language and express their meaning more briefly it certainly savoured less of the pomp and more of the circumstance of war than the correspondence of european commanders sheridan's cavalry had been assigned to the duty of guarding the train of four thousand wagons and feeling out to the left for the enemy the head of burnside's leading division was now seen crossing the river but as general grant was anxious to go to the front he decided not to wait to see burnside in person but to send him a note instead urging him to close up as rapidly as possible upon sedgwick's corps this communication was dispatched at eight forty one a m and the general immediately after directed the staff to mount and move forward with him along the gamana road after riding a mile an officer was seen coming toward us at a gallop and was soon recognized as colonel hyde of sedgwick's staff he halted in front of general grant and said general meade directed me to ride back and meet you and say that the enemy is still advancing along the turnpike and that warren's and sedgwick's troops are being put in position to meet him the general now started forward at an accelerated pace and after riding four miles farther along the gamana road came to the crossing of the orange turnpike here general meade was seen standing near the roadside he came forward on foot to give general grant the latest information the general now dismounted and the two officers began to discuss the situation it had become evident that the enemy intended to give battle in the heart of the wilderness and it was decided to establish the headquarters of both generals near the place where they were holding their present conference at the junction of these two important roads as this spot became the central point from which nearly all the orders of the commander were issued during one of the most desperate battles in the annals of history a description of the location is important in order to give the reader a clear understanding of the memorable events which took place in its vicinity a little to the east of the cross-roads stood the old wilderness tavern a deserted building surrounded by a rank growth of weeds and partly shut in by trees a few hundred yards to the west and in the northwest angle formed by the two intersecting roads was a knoll from which the old trees had been cut and upon which was a second growth of scraggy pine scrub oak and other timber the knoll was high enough to afford a view for some little distance but the outlook was limited in all directions by the almost impenetrable forest with its interlacing trees and tangled undergrowth the ground upon which the battle was fought was intersected in every direction by winding rivulets rugged ravines and ridges of mineral rock 
many excavations had been made in opening iron ore beds leaving pits bordered by ridges of earth trees had been felled in a number of places to furnish fuel and supply sawmills the locality is well described by its name it was a wilderness in the most forbidding sense of the word the headquarters wagons had followed the staff the tents were soon pitched and a camp was established on low ground at the foot of the knoll just described between it and the gamana road grant and meade had in the meantime taken up their positions on top of the knoll and stood there talking over the situation warren had joined them and had communicated the latest news from his front as soon as general grant learned the situation he followed his habitual custom in warfare and instead of waiting to be attacked took the initiative and pushed out against the enemy warren had been directed to move out in force on the orange turnpike getty's division of sedgwick's corps was put into position on warren's left and as soon as it was found that the enemy was advancing on the orange plank road orders were sent to hancock to hurry up his troops and take up a position on the left of getty while these preparations were progressing general grant lighted a cigar sat down on the stump of a tree took out his penknife and began to whittle a stick he kept on his brown thread gloves and did not remove them once during the entire day everything was comparatively quiet until the hour of noon when the stillness was suddenly broken by the sharp rattle of musketry and the roar of artillery these rounds were the quick messengers which told that warren had met the enemy and begun the conflict he encountered ewell's corps and drove it nearly a mile but was soon compelled to fall back and restore the connection which had been lost between his divisions warren then had a conference with general grant who proposed that they should ride out to the front he called for his horse which had remained saddled and directed me and another of the aides to accompany him as general warren was more familiar with the ground he rode ahead he was mounted on a fine-looking white horse was neatly uniformed and wore the yellow sash of a general officer he was one of the few officers who wore their sashes in a campaign or paid much attention to their dress the party moved to the front along a narrow country road bordered by a heavy undergrowth of timber and bristling thickets the infantry were struggling with difficulty through the dense woods the wounded were lying along the roadside firing still continued in front and dense clouds of smoke hung above the tops of the trees it was the opening scene of the horrors of the wilderness after having learned from personal inspection the exact character of the locality in which the battle was to be fought general grant returned to headquarters in order to be able to communicate more promptly with the different commands news had been received that hill's corps of lee's army was moving up rapidly on the orange plank road grant was now becoming impatient to take the initiative against the enemy and staff officers were sent with important orders to all parts of the line it was soon seen that the infantry would have to fight it out without much aid from the artillery as it was impossible to move many batteries to the front owing to the difficult nature of the ground hancock with great energy had thrown forward two of his divisions to support getty who had already attacked hill i was sent to communicate with hancock during this part of the engagement the fighting had become exceedingly severe on that part of the field general alexander hayes one of the most gallant officers in the service commanding one of hancock's brigades finding that his line had broken rushed forward to encourage his troop and was instantly killed getty and carroll were severely wounded after remaining for some time with hancock's men i returned to headquarters to report the situation to the general-in-chief and carried to him the sad intelligence of hay's death general grant was by no means a demonstrative man but upon learning the intelligence i brought he was visibly affected he was seated upon the ground with his back against a tree still whittling pine sticks he sat for a time without uttering a word and then speaking in a low voice and pausing between the sentences said hayes and i were cadets together for three years we served for a time in the same regiment in the mexican war he was a noble man and a gallant officer i am not surprised that he met his death at the head of his troops it was just like him he was a man who would never follow but would always lead in battle
wadsworth's division of warren's corps was sent to support hancock but it encountered great difficulty in working its way through the woods and darkness set in before it could get within striking distance of the enemy sedgwick had some fighting on the right of warren but no important results had been accomplished on his front about eight o'clock in the evening the firing died away and the troops in the immediate presence of the enemy lay on their arms to await the events of the morning sheridan had left a force in the rear sufficient to protect the trains and had formed the rest of his command so as to confront the enemy's cavalry which had been moved around by the right of the enemy's line he had severe fighting on our extreme left when we sat down at the mess table at headquarters that evening the events of the day were fully discussed and each staff officer related to the general in detail the scenes which had occurred upon the particular portion of the front which he had visited soon after we had risen from the table and left the mess tent meade walked over from his headquarters and he and the general-in-chief seated themselves by the camp-fire and talked over the events of the day and the plans for the morrow mr washburn and our staff officers made part of the group the general manifested intense anxiety in regard to relieving the wounded and the medical officers and commanders of troops were urged to make every possible effort to find the sufferers and convey them to the rear even in daylight it would have been a difficult undertaking to penetrate the thickets and carry the wounded to a place of safety but at night it was almost impossible for every time a lantern was shown or a noise made it was certain to attract the fire of the enemy however those who had been slightly wounded made their own way to the field hospitals and by dint of extraordinary exertions great numbers of the seriously wounded were brought to positions where they could be cared for during the conversation general grant remarked as burnside's corps on our side and longstreet's on the other side have not been engaged and the troops of both armies have been occupied principally in struggling through thickets and fighting for position to-day's work has not been much of a test of strength i feel pretty well satisfied with the result of the engagement for it is evident that lee attempted by a bold movement to strike this army in flank before it could be put into line of battle and be prepared to fight to advantage but in this he has failed the plan agreed upon that night for the coming struggle was as follows hancock and wadsworth were to make an attack on hill at four thirty a m so as to strike him if possible before longstreet could arrive to reinforce him burnside who would arrive early in the morning with three divisions was to send one division stevenson's to hancock and to put the other two divisions between wadsworth and warren's other divisions and attack hill in flank or at least obliquely while warren and sedgwick were to attack along their fronts inflict all the damage they could and keep the troops opposed to them from reinforcing hill and longstreet burnside's fourth division was to guard the wagon trains this division was composed of colored troops and was commanded by general ferrero general meade through whom all orders were issued to the army of the potomac was of the opinion that the troops could not be got into position for the attack as early as half-past four o'clock and recommended six but general grant objected as he was apprehensive that this might give the enemy an opportunity to take the initiative however he agreed to postpone the time till five o'clock and the final orders were given for that hour meade now arose said good night and walked over to his headquarters before eleven o'clock the general-in-chief remarked to the staff we shall have a busy day to-morrow and i think we had better get all the sleep we can to-night i am a confirmed believer in the restorative qualities of sleep and always like to get at least seven hours of it though i have often been compelled to put up with much less it is said remarked washburn that napoleon often indulged in only four hours of sleep and still preserved all the vigor of his mental faculties well i for one never believed those stories the general replied if the truth were known i have no doubt it would be found that he made up for his short sleep at night by taking naps during the day the chief then retired to his tent and his example was followed by all the officers who could be spared from duty the marked stillness which now reigned in camp formed a striking contrast to the shock and din of battle which had just ceased 
and which was so soon to be renewed. End of chapter 3